Welcome everyone. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, our first um, webinar for Architects Declare. My name is Anthony DeMarze and I've helped put this together with Stefan Welsh and Talina. So if anyone can um, I'm getting a few messages here. So look, bear with us while we work through some technical issues, but I assume everyone can uh, hear me at the moment. Uh, and I'll very soon be introducing uh, Stefan Welsh, who will tell us what's been going on and uh, introduce Paul Ha. So the session, uh, Paul will speak for approximately an hour and we'll have uh, a question, um, question and answer Q&A at the end of it and we'll pose those questions to Paul. So we'll compile all of the questions in the chat box and, and consolidate them and then ask um, Paul those questions on your behalf. Um, I would like to do a welcome to country. I'm sorry I don't have uh, the text in front of me but we really want to acknowledge uh, the custodians of the land, uh, the indigenous, our indigenous friends on whose land we're on. Um, and we absolutely think that's very important. So I'm sorry I don't have the formal welcome to country. Um, but without further ado, what I'll do is I'll introduce Stefan Welsh, who will talk a little bit about, um, <coughs> who talk a little bit about where Architects Declare is, and then introduce Paul Hart. Thanks. All right, one and a half, okay. All right, one and a half meter distance. Um, yeah, um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for, yeah, thanks for making the time and attending our um, virtual, virtual meetup. Um, so yeah, I hope um, this finds you safe, um, healthy and optimistic. Um, I'm sure sort of everybody has very similar feelings and you know, it feels so very, very surreal. Um, but of course, you know, this is a moment where sort of now we reflect and um, and very sort of realize it's now no more important than ever um, to work together and sort of care for each other, care for the planet, um, and obviously continue um, on sort of you now working for the important matters. And one of them is obviously Arctic Declare and doing everything in our professional capacity um, to make our contribution um, to stop climate change. <clears throat> so. Um, before we start, actually, I'd, I'd like actually I'd also like to uh, thank John Warden's office. Um, the presentation was going to be at his office, um, and obviously, for obvious reason, um, it was it was cancelled. But I'm sure we'll get another opportunity to get together, um, and I look forward um, to doing that sort of at his office to have a, a meetup at a later stage. So yeah, before we start, um, maybe just a brief update um, on the Arctic declares at. Um, so today we have um, 880 signatures, which is fantastic. Um, obviously, the carbon neutral campaign, um, our practices going carbon neutral, um, that Jer Jeremy McLeod from Green Architecture initiated last year is well underway. Um, one good thing about um, Architects Declare as a movement is that it does generate um, a lot of activity and encourages us to take action um, take actions um, that we sort of um, deem to be appropriate. So there was there were quite a few good activities. The Institute of Architects Climate Change Forum in February was a big success. Um, plus architecture, for example, as some of you might have seen that, um, declared that they are committing not to specify materials that are on the red list. On the red list, um, and we will have a presentation. Um, and discussion about this sort of later in the year. Um, a lot of volunteers have come forward and um, we are in the process of um, establishing working groups um, on, um, and we talk about this um, at the end of, at the, end of um, the presentation a bit as well. So we're in the process of setting up working groups and um, obviously we also want to encourage um, volunteers um, to come forward and, and support, um, yeah, sort of, um, support the movement. And, um, the website is underway, um, so it's being um, set up as we speak, um, and that obviously will then uh, allow us more easily to share information and <coughs> um, and support each other in our professions of activities. So that's sort of a good transition to um, 
Oh, Anthony just sent me a message saying, what did you say? Um, just ask people to say hi in the chat box. Um, can you please say hi in the chat box? Um, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> so that gives me a good uh, um, opportunity to um, introduce Paul. So um, as you have figured out, it's all new to us. So um, I wasn't sure if the screen sharing was going to work. So I just thought I might just do a Bob Dylan impersonation. Um, I've never done screen sharing. I haven't never done a Bob Dylan impersonation either. So I'll see how it works. So this is, um, so this is Paul Ha. He's been a Melbourne-based architect um, for about 40 years, had always had a very strong ESD focus and community-based housing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Northern Australia. He had a long-held passion for natural building materials, water and energy conservation, and community-based um, building culture. <clears throat> um, some of his sort of um, significant projects include um, self-help housing um, with remote Indigenous Australians, um, the Kendall Bark School Library, <clears throat> And the series Fairwood, and recently the design guide um, for the Mullen Creek Eco Housing Project, um, where I had the pleasure to working with him, um, and very generally sort of gave me a pretty hard time to improve my designs, um, choose the right materials, and improve my detailing. <clears throat> so I thought he'd be he'd be the perfect expert um, to talk about um, the impact of building materials um, and building scale in this emergency. Um, so he will introduce principles and methods in selecting building materials, relevant for addressing our climate and biodiversity emergency. And I look forward to his presentation and hand over to you, Paul. Thank you. Unpressed mute. Unpressed mute. Uh, where's that? Hang on. Pause. Pause. Just a sec. Am I, am I muted? No? You're fine now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Stefan. That was a very creative way to introduce me. And it was all synchronised as well. What, I don't know how you did that. The pages actually match what you were, that you weren't looking at, match what you were saying. Very good. Um, look, yeah, I'll, thank you for um, inviting me to um, talk uh, this evening with everybody. I've, it's the first time I've participated in a webinar, let alone um, presented at one, so... You, Excuse me with my clumsiness, everyone, please. Um, I was reflecting on um, the, the, um, the, um, the, the, you know, the um, welcome to country and mindful that we're all being all on our screens in different parts of Australia and certainly all over Victoria, we're, all, we're in different countries. We're not in the same room, different um, traditional country. I'm um, currently in in South Gippsland, and that's the Bunwang people that I'm acknowledging. Uh, and in doing that, I, I, I ref, in, in that uh, thinking about all this in the context of the COVID crisis we have, I couldn't help thinking uh, about my time um, when I was very blessed with the opportunity of living and working with um, with the Yulnu people in homeland centres of South Central Arnhem Land. And that was back in the mid 1980s. And in those remote parts, that was only one generation on uh, from when they first began to interact substantially with the white man's world. And uh, I was able to observe how when someone fell ill without clear reason, it was seen by the tribe to be caused by supernatural invention, interventions in response to environmental and social or spiritual dysfunction. And then epidemics like smallpox, tuberculosis and measles that these communities suffered soon after first contact with Europeans, though they were not of their making, uh, they would have also explained them in this way. I thought that's fairly poignant at the moment. We're gathering as architects in the face of a climate and biodiversity emergency. We've declared our concern, we want to act, and we have a COVID curve ball to deal with as well. I thought about trying to discuss building materials with you in address of this full package of threats. But the prospect absolutely did my head in because it involves a lot of speculation on how this pandemic will play out. 
So I'm proposing to talk first and foremost about environmentally and socially responsible building materials and building methods, uh, pretending that COVID is not happening. And then to finish with some thoughts on the opportunities that this pandemic presents to society, to the planet, and also to us as architects. So I'm going too fast with my slides. The World Green Building Council has for some time put buildings as responsible for 39% of global CO2 emissions. If you add that to the biodiversity decline that's attached to both the procurement of building materials and the commandeering of previously natural ecosystems to locate our built environment, it becomes patently clear that we, as architects and town planners, are key accomplices to this problem before us all. That said, we can also be key drivers for environmentally and socially regenerative change. Now, there are three main prongs to the approach that architects can take in this climate and biodiversity emergency. And you'll know of some of these, or most of these. Firstly, it's to address the operational impacts of buildings. And that to date has been the pre predominant focus. Secondly, it's to address the impacts embodied in construction of buildings. And that's mainly bound up in the materials that we use. So specifying building materials responsibly has a far larger immediate impact in this emergency. And this is what I'll be focusing on this, in this talk. And finally, our, the other most important prong is to address the size of buildings which has the most significant impact on the first and the second poles, but which are hardly spoken about at all by architects. I'll begin, I'll speak briefly to each of these before talking about how we can specify building materials that cost the earth less. So certainly the focus of the World Green Building Council until last year, as of the AIA's Climate Super Action Forum in Melbourne seven weeks ago that Stefan mentioned. Uh, we have been improving uh, on uh, operational energy efficiency of buildings. That's been the focus of those initiatives towards achieving net zero operational carbon. As that relates to fixed mechanical and electrical services and loose appliances, as well, of course, to the thermal performance of buildings. So thermal performance is based on benchmarks, which for housing in Australia have been set by the BCA at six star, by passive hosts at an equivalent of around seven star on the, on the um, Natter's scale, by design guidelines for eco housing estates like Corumban Eco Village, Queensland, beyond today, which is in South Australia, the Cape, very close to me here in Cape Patterson and Mullum Creek in Melbourne. And they uh, have a benchmark of a minimum 7.5 star. And then there's also professional bodies like the BDAV that have this sustainable design challenge, which they've benchmarked at 10 star. And you can see in that uh, sort of table below, a 10 star implies virtually no energy is required to heat and cool a house throughout the year. Even a superficial review of this approach raises a bunch of issues. In 2016, Swinburne Uni and sustainability consultants Pitt and Sherry, they confirmed what some of us had long feared, and that's that the value of Australia's home energy efficiency rating system matters. For the most, it's seriously eroded by lax and optimistic software data entry by energy assessors and by material substitutions and poor construction detailing on site. The Uni and Pitt and Sherry uh, found that these practices reduce the thermal performance of homes as they're built commonly by one to 1 1.5 stars below the certified rating. If I just quickly take it back 
to that scale, you can see, so if, you, if you're targeting 75%, you're going down 1.5, it nearly doubles the energy used in a year, so you can call a home. So this weakness in the system can be addressed with a few relatively simple measures, which we employed for the Mullum Creek Eco Housing Project in Donvale, which is an outer suburb of Melbourne. We required that energy ratings to 7.5 star be undertaken using accurate, accurate, so, and that be done by one nominated independent rigorous assessor for all homes across the state that the developer nominated. And once construction was underway, we provided lot owners with, with a free inspection service to ensure that the thermal performance that was designed into the home was actually carried through to the final constructed outcome. Both energy assessments and construction overview were generously funded by the developer, which is a family of environmental philanthropists, Sue, Steve and Danny Matthews. In cool temperate climates like Melbourne, it's not actually that easy to achieve a genuine 7.5 star energy rating, which Stefan and many other terrific architects discovered. So that's the thermal performance that almost halves the space heating and cooling requirement attached to the nationally mandated six star minimum. We found that homes with anything other than compact architectural form and a modest amount of well-oriented glazing, they struggled to reach seven and a half star without all of the following design features in place. So they needed to have high levels of insulation in external walls and roof ceilings. They needed to be, have double glazed or triple glazed windows with high thermal resistance and solar heat gain coefficient. And interestingly also, they needed to often to have substantial and continuous insulation to lower floors if they didn't have all the other uh, elements in place in terms of passive design or solar design. Now I've got my thoughts on how government should act to lock in more respectable thermal performance of buildings, but I won't bore you with that here. As architects who declare, I suggest we focus on securing as built, say, 7.5, eight star homes. We should do that by teaming up with highly competent energy assessors who we beg to consult without fear or favour through the design, certification and construction phases of our projects. Better that than to cajole them towards a good look, but low bang for buck and frankly unnecessary 10 star standard or, or target. Our energy assessors also need to be paid properly for the substantial work that goes into a truly rigorous service. Okay, so what about building materials, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about? A report was tabled at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2018, and it put the world's consumption of materials at above 100 billion tonnes a year, and that quadrupled since 1970, whilst population in that period only doubled. So between 2016 and 2018, just two years, this consumption had jumped by more than 8%, yet the reuse of materials had fallen from 9.1% to 8.6%. According to the CEO of Circle Economy, Harald Fiedel, who, who tabled the report, he said, we risk global disaster if we continue to treat the world's resources as if they were limited. Now, the lion's share of these materials, nearly 40%, is turned into housing alone of all the materials that are used on the planet, that we draw from the planet. So the World Green Building Council also tells us of all global carbon emissions that are attributable to the built environment, 28% are embodied mainly in the procurement of materials used to construct them. There are no clear figures for Australia on this, but from some e tool outputs that um, 
you've played in with in my office. And the work of Andre Stefan and Robert Crawford at Melbourne Uni. I'd like to suggest that the ratio between embodied carbon and operational carbon in Australian building stock is much higher than the global, global average. And that's because of three reasons. I think three I've got here. There might be more. Um, one is that floor area that's attributable to each occupant in our homes and our workplaces, as well as the volume of vacant buildings in our cities and at our holiday destinations, they're higher than any, almost anywhere else in the world. Note from that, this infographic by Stefan and Crawford, that as building size per occupant increases, operational energy use increases, but at a much lower rate, as you'd expect. Also in Australia, we've got relatively, a relatively benign climate that moderates heating and cooling loads. And also our newer habitable building stock, it generally has better thermal performance, better appliance efficiency, and better maintenance than that in much of the developing world where construction has charged forward to a lower performance standard and at a blistering, ra blistering rate on the whole. And finally, we're advised by the Australian Bureau of Statistics that 40% of Australian waste to landfill originates from the building industry. Per square metre of floor area, and I'll stress per square metre, this is not per home, it's fair to say that the operational energy and water efficiency of buildings in Australia is slowly improving. What this means though, is that the materials used to construct them remain as a primary driver to their overall life cycle and environmental impact. And you can see that here on this bar chart that it had sort of um, built from uh, some ETOR analysis of some homes at Mullen Creek and also the, the research by Crawford and Stefan. You can see how dominant construction is and how when we increase star rating, uh, things don't change all that much because the space heating and cooling component of the overall life cycle environmental impact is actually relatively minor. Uh, it might reduce significantly with a higher star rating, but the overall impact to the build are still really high. Uh, it's still not, not so much changed or reduced. Services, services and appliances, they can be upgraded to embrace new technologies and to provide improved energy and water efficiencies through what now needs to be long service life for all buildings. But our specification of building materials commonly comes with more serious and they are immediate environmental impacts that are irreversibly locked in as we begin construction. There are tools available to verify life cycle environmental impacts. So that's embodied and operational impacts such as carbon emissions, water use, toxicity of materials and, and, and operational practices in the, build, in the building through its life. Ecosystem degradation, all from cradle to grave. There might be some ter terrific ones out there, these tools. But those that I've engaged with can tend to draw on inflexible assumptions about the future. They can produce quite different outputs from the same data entry or entry data, sorry. Um, and they can result in reports of only limited benefit considering the time and money that goes into them. Certainly that's the case for smaller builds. We can avail ourselves of these tools and I expect they'll get smarter over time. But in this emergency, we could instead respond to a simple truth, and that's that the cement and concrete products, the steel, the fired clay products, the timber, and the swimming pools we discovered 
are currently the most impacting materials to be locked into our buildings as they rise from the ground. A couple of thumbnail sums and a good dose of critical and future thinking go a long way in guiding our material specifications towards environmental and social responsibility. So let's start with cement and concrete. The World Green Building Council again, beyond zero emissions and other respectable sources agree that the manufacture of Portland cement alone is not just all of concrete, just the, the cement that goes in, it accounts for a whopping 8% of the planet's greenhouse gas emissions. So that's roughly the same as the entire transport sector. It's, it's hard to believe, but it's true. But there are alternative, equally effective and readily available concrete binders, such as fly ash, which is a waste from coal-fired power generation, and slag, which is a byproduct from steel smelting, that can be used as binders. They're alternative binders, and they're collectively referred to as supplementary cementitious materials, or SCMs. The Mullen Creek design guidelines required that SCMs make up a minimum 30% of the cement used in wet mix structural concrete. And some architects and engineers choose to increase that to around 60% where surface finish is critical. As construction commenced on the estate at Mullen Creek, we found that more and more local batching plants were supplying concrete with SCMs with no increase to supply cost. In time, it should be considerably cheaper, we're told, by these batches, because slag and fly ash are problematic, problematic industrial wastes that are otherwise expensive to dispose of. The initial resistance to SCM subsided as concreters at Mullen Creek found ground slabs containing SCMs were stronger and with less shrinkage cracking, as the shot creek, shot creek sprayers learnt to add water, not to add water so liberally to adjust the workability of the SCM mix on site. And as bricklayers and rammed earth wall contractors realised that bagged cement containing 50% SCM, such as Australian Builders Eco Blend, which is on the left of your screen, was equivalent to the general purpose Portland cement in both performance and price. My next job is to convince Rand Earth wall builders that Australian builders sound like a bit of a, um, a, bit of a, um, a, a marketer for Australian builders, but I'm not. Um, that Australian builders steel pave being 85% white slag will also perform well as a cementitious material without reducing those nice earthy wall colours to a drab grey. The other week I was on the phone with a bright young architect from Stefan's office. His name is Rodrigo Rocker. He recalled someone from, I think he mentioned it was someone from Austria, telling him that rammed earth in Australia, not Austria, is not rammed earth, but it's rather just dirty concrete. And he's right. There's certainly nothing environmentally responsible about building a 350 millimetre thick rammed earth wall containing 10% Portland cement by volume. The mix for a 90, 190 millimetre thick hollow concrete block contains only 14% Portland cement. And the volume of this, of this material that's going into that wall is, it's, hugely less, so much less imp impacting than most of the rammed earth walls that are going up at the moment. When I was a young bloke, we built a lot with rammed earth and puddled mud. We put effort into selecting and blending aggregate with the right gradation of particle size and colloidal content to achieve good strength and weatherability without the need for cement. We followed the CSIRO National Building Technology Centre Bulletin 5 and Earth Wall Construction. And we did the, which is still in, 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 not in print, but you can find it on the net. And we did the old fashioned thing 
of erecting test panels before proceeding with each build. What about steel? I think there's nothing wrong with a piece of corrugated iron. Profile sheet steel for wall and roof cladding provides an expanse of robust and almost maintenance free cover that's difficult to surpass at less than half a millimetre, half a millimetre of material thickness. That said, reducing the amount of weighty steel in construction is one of the best ways to minimise embodied carbon. Because steel's carbon footprint or virgin steel's carbon footprint per unit volume is almost beyond compare amongst common building materials, which if you've got a magnifying glass on you, you'll be able to see on this table. <coughs> you'll see steel is up around uh, in excess of um, 10 times it per unit weight. Uh, they have a similar um, density, uh, but you'll see by per unit, per unit density or per unit weight or volume, uh, 10 times the uh, embodied carbon and embodied energy that go into them. It's quite extraordinary. In too many simple structures that I see you know, around the traps, I find there's steel used where substitution with a sustainably sourced timber would have been a cost-saving no-brainer. On some sites, it's almost obscene. These are architect-designed homes. The Mullen Creek design guidelines include a requirement that prohibits the use of cold form steel framing but the use of hot roll steel is permitted. I learned more recently, some years after we finalised the um, design guidelines for Mile Creek, that the Corumban Eco Village up at Queensland prohibited hot rolled steel and it did so without undue resistance. So in retrospect, I reckon we could have done this too. Nonetheless, the Mile Creek Steel Products Guide, which you can find on the website, on the Mullen Creek website, lists steel products that are manufactured locally via comparatively energy efficient ISO accredited processes. Our local eco warrior, Juice Backer, argues that steel is fully recyclable and so the ultimate framing timber. When the day comes that global industry draws solely on recycled steel stock, and renewable energy for its re-smelting, I might look to agree with him. But until then, and it looks to me to be a long way off, this climate and biodiversity emergency must have us desperately seeking to minimise the amount of structural steel we shove into our buildings. While working through some details for a reinforced concrete ground slab a while back, I did a few simple sums and I realised that its embodied carbon could be reduced by increasing slab thickness to allow a reduction in the gauge of slab mesh. And you'd think that to be counterintuitive, but such is the potency of embodied carbon in steel that we need to address. We need to start questioning architecture on our drawing boards that relies on highly reinforced concrete and hot rolled steel to stand up. We need to ask ourselves why such structurally demanding designs are necessary. Are we chasing building heights that are simply unsustainable, also by broader environmental and economic and social measure? Or has our architectural flair for gravity defying cantilevers overtaken our responsibility to design light and lean in response? to the emergency before us. What other less impacting materials could we use for these structures? And that brings me to timber. You'll see this everywhere. Wood is good, end of story, make it wood. Contrary to popular belief and some heavy, heavy marketing, timber can be the very best or the very worst material you will work with as an architect or a builder. 
depending on where and how it's sourced. If it's sourced sensitively, it can store carbon through and beyond its service life in construction. It can be reused or recycled, or it can be harvested from deliberately planted and sensitively managed forest, and then helping to maintain healthy ecological processes, sequestering atmospheric carbon, and contributing to the social and economic well-being of rural communities. The timber that's harvested insensitively can result in serious and irreversible impacts on flora and fauna, on soil health and waterways. It can reduce or even reverse a forest system's sequestration of atmospheric carbon, and it can erode the well-being of rural communities. There's lots you can read on this. Even before our current bushfires commenced in September, deforestation was responsible for some 17% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And unfortunately, a bulk of structural and architectural timbers that we specify in Australia are sourced in ways that contribute directly and indirectly to this forest demise. The laundering of illegally harvested forest woods into massive and opaque timber supply chains, some of it with PEFC or AFS or even FSC environmental certifications. This stands as the largest illicit building, uh, business on the planet behind human trafficking and narcotics. Over the past few years, our Bunnings stores have tr transitioned they're sourcing, not only Bunnings, but all the major timber outlets, most of which are even you know, it's the home builder, the, the commercial home builder will go to. They've transitioned their sourcing of softwood framing timber away from fast growing radiata pine, from temperate climate Australian and New Zealand plantations. And they're transitioning towards slow grown Baltic pine from cold climate Russian and Eastern European native forests. Many architects and I find even tradespeople on site are not really across this. You can see that it's very easy to see the difference. So radiata pine grows fast in it, uh, and you can see the growth rings are really quite far apart across a bit of 90 by 35. Look at a piece of Baltic pine, you'll see probably 100 years of growth just in a piece that's 90 by 35. Uh, these, are, these are being cut from trees of 200 to 400 years of age. The current rate of deforestation of Northern Hemisphere boreal forests, which is where they come from, that's the largest terrestrial biome on the planet. So you can see that great big green band in the Northern Hemisphere across there, across Canada and Europe and right through huge Russia. That's where this timber that we, we find in our bunny stores comes from. And it's been uh, pulled out at a rapid rate and causing all sorts of other issues. Um, you can see the, the dark purple colours uh, where it's particularly severe and red. So there's major net loss of, um, of forest cover in those areas due to um, the, de the deforestation. Um, that will have catastrophic impact on our, cli on our global climate if it continues. Also in Australia, the logging of native forests, both legal and some illegal, drives biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. It also encourages pest, weed and exposure related tree dieback, which in turn exacerbates wildfire risk. These damaging impacts are now compounded by a hotter and drier climate. So this time last year, our country's higher labour costs and slowing, slowly raising environmental concern saw at least a good portion of Victoria's remnant forest, native forest, protected from logging. Conveniently at those times, we turn again to tropical rainforests of poor Southeast Asian and Amazonian countries for our Kumaru decks and Merbu window joinery.
sadly these days, a year is, has now become a long time for a native forest. In the wake of our horrific black summer, the Australian timber industry is now poised to mechanically thin those native forest reserves that remain intact. It's proposed in the name of fuel reduction, overriding state powers to decree by the decree of the federal government as, as, an, as an emergency response. Even architecture and design reckons this has got merit. Meanwhile, we have a chorus of world-renowned forest ecologists and fire scientists in Australia, such as David Lindenmeyer, from, who's at the ANU, who draw on clear evidence from the field to demonstrate that mechanical thinning of Australia's tall forests will not lessen fire risk, but instead it will increase it. The timber lobby is powerful, whilst the central tenet of the global movement to arrest climate and biodiversity collapse, the central tenet is to listen to the peer-reviewed science. As Australian architects who declare, let's make something good out of our bushfire tragedy and ensure through our specifications and site inspections that only timber sourced from trees purposefully planted on previously cleared Australian or New Zealand farmland or what's recycled from prior constructions that only that makes its way to our builds, onto our builds. This leaves many good timber choices across all architectural and engineering applications and it sends a strong message to the now global timber industry, timber industry that we need to entertain only fairly sourced wood. Mullen Creek requires that timbers be sourced locally in accordance with quite stringent environmental and social criteria. We compiled background papers and a comprehensive list of readily available timber products suited to all applications and budgets. So you'll find these documents on the Mullen Creek website. We're really pleased and a little surprised with how architects, landscape designers and builders are with minimal resistance embracing the sustainable timber products we're requiring them to choose from. And we know they're carrying this new product awareness to their other jobs. Also, this material that's on the web is finding its way into design offices that um, other than those that have engaged with Moral Creek, which is tremendous. This is a job of mine from a while back. It's a small library and a wildfire shelter for Candlebark School in the Macedon Ranges. It has a lot of wood in it, and it's all sourced from Australian softwood plantations and recycled hardwood. Um, the, all of the main framing is obviously um, it's in LVL, it's uh, grown in plantation in Western Australia, supplied by Wesbeam, and the, uh, the windows are recycled black butt from an old warehouse in, um, in Sydney. Um, you'll often hear that wood is sustainable because it's ultimately renewable and it sequesters atmospheric carbon. In this case, that's true. But how much CO2 is actually sequestered in this woody build? Well, it's 90 tonnes that I'll work out of seasoned wood. <clears throat> It sequesters around 90 times 1.8, or around 160 tonnes of CO2. But that was only just covered, the, but that just covered the CO2 that was emitted in the manufacture and transport of the engineered timber products, the LVL and the plywood, together with the cement and concrete products for ground slabs and block walls for thermoplastic drainage cells and waterproofing membranes, for the glass and the carpet, and making a nominal additional allowance for miscellaneous bits, bits and bobs for this earth-covered building. And 160 tonnes of atmospheric carbon, they're emitted by an average Aussie family of four every two years. The simple arithmetic of this is really quite confronting. 
The past four years, we've been able to extend the timber initiative of Murrum Creek into a launch of a new social enterprise called Series Fairwood. The profits from Series Fairwood go back into Series Community Environment Park, which you've, people from Melbourne and the women on this webinar will probably know it's a wonderful place in Brunswick. Fairwood removes itself from the adversarial forest debate and from opaque environmental certification schemes. It aggregates and retails timbers inside, inside short supply chains with tree farmers and portable sawmill operators who we know personally. They're mostly small producers who are geographically dispersed and struggle to find, sell and deliver to a market that fully appreciates the trees and the timber that we've got on offer. Fairwood buys only from growers and millers who source wood to the highest standards of environmental and social responsibility being informed by the Mullen Creek project. We share their stories directly with our customers, which are building and landscape contractors, furniture makers and, and DIYers. Fairwood business builds direct friendships and understandings between city and country folk, and it encourages farming families to revegetate their bare paddocks with trees for conservation and for profit. I'm in the process of writing a paper on timber for the AIA's environment design guide. And once that's done, I'd be happy to present again to architects to clear on this subject of timber. For me, the only really disappointing thing about the Mullum Creek project was our failure to cap the scale of homes that were built there. There are some monsters on the estate in this peri-urban so in the peri-urban surrounds that it has. Um, sorry, there are some monster, uh, monster houses on the estate and the peri-urban surrounds, they didn't exactly provide commercial courage for such a move because there are lots of other big houses surrounding the estate. Another terrific infographic by Stefan uh, and Stefan and Crawford shows how in just 26 years, between 1984 and 2010, house size nearly doubled in Australia, from 50 square metres to a gobsmacking 87 square metres per occupant. How much house is enough? And how much of the Earth's material and energy resources are needed to comfortably house an Aussie? There's nothing sustainable about an eight plus star, 400 or 500 square metre house. Going forward, as architects who declare, can we simply refuse to serve clients who ask us to work on homes that already have or will have a floor area greater than, say, 60 square metre floor area per occupant or per bedroom? By now, some of you are probably hating me, I guess. Um, can we at least impress on our clients that quantity of construction drives precious material consumption and the carbon footprint upward. Whereas quality of construction calls on smart design and craftsmanship, on the good work of people rather than our planetary limits. Putting this concern about building scale aside, the Mullen Creek project will certainly serve as an exemplar for site sensitive building and landscape design. It'll showcase energy efficient architecture and it'll promote the use of environmentally responsible building materials. So things that you'll see in place on the estate. But I think its bigger legacy will be in published and freely shared learnings, which are a welcome change from guarded IP. And in the advancement of people, so lot owners, designers, builders, who've been able to engage with the project. <coughs> A good moment 
here for me to acknowledge the tremendous contributions of my colleagues and friends. Uh, architects Brendan Pallum and Mayan Puri, engineer Jessamy Yule and Rafi Cruz, who teamed up with me on the Mullen Creek project. Rafi was, has a background in geology, beekeeping and climate change research. She's not an architect, but Trey has been a particular strength. So much of what, or I should say by qualification, she's not an architect. So much of what I've been able to share with you here about Mullen Creek and Ceres Fairwood is the fruit of her tireless and rigorous work method. Her extraordinary technical smarts, her intuition and her humanity. She also helped me to get this presentation together. So now to conclude, with that coronavirus curveball thrown into the mix. COVID takes the air from our lungs as we've logged and burnt the lungs from our earth. Affluenza fuels international flights and ocean cruises. If we fly to Europe once each year, that almost doubles our personal carbon footprint as Australians for reasons I can explain later if anyone's interested. So infinitely more than what those Qantas offsets would suggest. And now these flights and cruises are prime vectors for this pandemic. A number of commentators in recent days have suggested we use this time to lay low and reflect on the poor environmental and social justice the intergenerational burden and the sheer fragility that underlies current global economic systems, which we've worshipped or been battered by, depending on our life circumstances. But either way, we've done it for far too long now. I love this poem by Kitty Omar Omira. You may have already read it. It's now gone viral via 350.org and possibly other um, plays as well. It elicits a range of responses. Some people cry with relief for the nature they love. Some fear that society is not as lovely as the poem suggests. And others worry for those who are too impacted by the crisis to stay home, to rest and play games. They're all quite valid emotions. Nonetheless, this gives our planet a breather and it's our chance to again think globally and to act locally and to discover, to rediscover that small is beautiful. It's the F. Shumaha. Architecture that repairs the health of our environmental and social systems, it doesn't exist in a bubble. We'll struggle to genuinely practice regenerative design on a principled footing without also living regenerative lives that deeply and intrinsically reconnect us with nature and allow us to see things and feel things through the eyes and hearts of others. We can each find different ways, drawing on our individual capacities and experience and strengths to live such a life. To give you a better sense of what I'm suggesting, I can only share with you quickly about my own journey. As a child, I was gifted a sensibility for communal self-reliance from my extended family, which was of Templar German origin. And I was drawn to Ceres Community Environment Park in East, in East Brunswick as a young bloke, as one of its founding members in the early 80s, and I never looked back. This background brought me the courage to take a sidestep upon graduating as an architect, to live and work with rural and remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities in support of their aims. To design their own homes in ways that were meaningful to them. 
to build their own homes using materials which were freely available in the local bush and to adopt simple construction methods which were suited to the community workforce, which were men, women and children, all with vastly different levels of skill and energy. Back in Victoria a decade later, I was able to follow my dreams. To re a forest, a degraded paddock in South Gippsland. To build an autonomous house in my spare time as I found the DOSH to do it. To team up with neighbouring farmers and supporters from both the city and the bush to reforest our local valleys between Western Port Bay and the Basque Coast. We were able to plant 400,000 locally indigenous trees and shrubs within a decade. That's what people power can do. I was able to follow in my grandpa's footsteps and grow fruit and veggies for my family, our friends, and for organic retailers, Series Fair Food, and other social enterprises series, and to Terra Madre. This place, and it's where I am now, It'll always be my laboratory for learning and it'll be a life joy, lifelong joy. So to you young ones Zooming with us, I'd like to reassure you or assure you that there are lots of fun ways to be an architect. This suite of crises that we have in front can serve us up as many opportunities as constraints. We can skill up to this emergency most effectively by collaborating generously, not only within our profession, but also with absolutely anyone and everyone who's willing to play with us. Include our building user groups as central players in participatory design and construction processes. Let's influence and inform new aesthetic sensibilities that have us vomiting at the sight of wasteful opulence and excessive scale. That see us celebrate proud self builders. And that leave us in awe of creativity that can be born of hardship. We could even suggest that a green building is one that's already there. Together, let's delicately rework existing buildings where we can apply our finest design skills to minimise natural resource depletion and to give our planet a chance to heal. Except that a gentle architectural approach may not catch the eye of yesterday's, maybe tomorrow's glossy magazines, but know that future life on earth will be thankful for it. So now might be the time for a revolution in architecture. And thank you everyone, that's, that's all from me. Thank you. Do I have to mute? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now, Paul? No, I can. Do I mute? Mute myself? <laughs> I think you stay unmuted because we're going to ask a few questions. Okay. Um, so we might, I'll tag team with, um, you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat bar. I think, I think, uh, yeah, if we yeah, could all give you a round of applause or thumbs up, I'm sure everyone would, because I think that was a really, really, really insightful um, talk. So well done and beautifully presented. Um, so I'm going to read from the screen. I'm going to ask a few questions um, and we'll see how we go. So how are you feeling about uh, answering a few tough questions? We'll give it a crack. <laughs> I'll read the first one, which came earlier today. It wasn't actually during the, the talk. And I'll, as I say, I'll tag team with Stefan. But the first one comes from Danny <clears throat> Carney. Uh, he says, the bushfires of 2019 and 20 have major implications for timber supply for the industry and for biodiversity within protected areas. Across all states, both tenures of land have suffered enormous losses. In response to industry and governments in Victoria and New South Wales, 
are exploring ways to make protected reserves available for salvage logging and for future harvesting. And the Tasmanian government is opening former reserves for harvesting as early as this year. In such a context, what is the future of wood, especially native species in sustainable building? Oh gosh, that's a, a ripper of a question and a, a big one with lots of layers to the answer. Um, I, um, the, the, the question is spot on. There are so, so many uh, forces at play now um, from the timber industry in effort to open up uh, the, the areas that haven't been burnt uh, in, you know, across Australia. And um, there's resistance from the state government uh, at the moment, the, the Andrews government, uh, to that. Uh, there's, as I mentioned in the talk, there are a lot of very eminent and experienced forest scientists and fire scientists that say we must leave these forests intact if we're going to, um, uh, if we're going to uh, retain for them that their, 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 their functionality in, in, in holding biodiversity of any reasonable standard or trying to arrest the climate crisis we've got as well. We really need to do that. Um, and so uh, th there's, there's massive issues with this. Um, and the problem also is, of course, when we, if you, when the, you close up the, um, the, these reserves in, um, in uh, Australia, like I mentioned, we go overseas. But, there's, it, but there are quite ridiculous situations at play at the moment. For example, with, and, and COVID play into this as well, because in COVID a lot can happen quietly on the sides now. Lots of shifts can, can um, and, and, and things can be approved by government that otherwise wouldn't, and they go under the radar of the, of the, of the community because we have other more immediate worries. Um, there are things happening at the moment that I read, like for example, in New Zealand, they have massive amounts of plantation pine that 90% of which they export in log form to China and Japan, for example. And those logs are, um, then get processed in China. Currently, China is not accepting those logs for a number of reasons, but COVID's part of it. But they also have their economy is slowing and they don't have uh, the need for this timber. Meanwhile, we're, we, we, are, we have blue gum plantations in Western Victoria, which are being bulldozed because they were, well, they were bulldozed six months ago or a year ago because the price on wood chip was so poor. So we only drew wood chip from our native forest, which is a massive burden on the forest. And we could be using the blue gum for wood chip. Of course, now the, the price of wood chip has gone right up again. Um, uh, now that we bulldozed it. Um, in Australia, it's extraordinary. Uh, we've got issues where we don't replant in Australia. Uh, we haven't been re replanting softwoods at, at anywhere near the rate that we need to. There's been very little and very little uh, planting of, of native hardwood as well um, compared to the demand. Um, and the reason is it's all about money. So it's about the fact that if you can source Baltic pine more cheaply from the other side of the planet using slave labour from North Korea, drawing it out of Russian forest, and you can bring that to Australia uh, uh, and, and to, at a cheaper price, you can sell it to the Australian you know, building industry at the same price and, and make more profit from this. And these are major, major issues. Um, what the future is for, for the, for the for the uh, for architects in, in our use of timber is is a really really difficult question. We just need to be part of a movement that just plants the crap out of Australia, and, and not only not only just for, um, for, for in, in, perpetu in, in perpetuity for um, arresting climate change, but also smartly for timber production for conservation prof profit. We have so much degraded marginal farmland in Australia that's not doing much bare land that would grow trees very, very well. We 
we just need to plant like crazy. And there will be a period uh, in the next years, uh, depending on how COVID pans out and, and what the demands on, on timber are around the planet with that, but there may be a time when we um, soon where we don't, um, where, you know, where, a time where we need to really hold back in our use of timber. So that's a very long answer to a, sorry, but to a really difficult question. We've got quite a few questions, Paul. Yeah, I'll keep them shorter. That was a hard one. <laughs> no disrespect, because uh, we're getting uh, yeah. lots of questions coming through and yeah. um, I'm sure everyone would like to. So we'll, yeah. we, we will limit the number of questions, but maybe shorter answers so that we can get through. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, not an issue at all. So, um, yeah, so un unless we can get takeaway food delivered in about two hours time, um, mm -hmm. I'm happy, happy to continue. But thanks for thanks for a great presentation. Um, Obviously, you know, very inspiring, very insightful, and thanks for everyone to engaging and um, asking questions. Um, apologies if you can't answer all of them, um, but keep asking. Um, I think it's very important that, that, that we engage, and I think it's great to see everybody engaged. Um, Chris, a uh, question from Chris Bunting. Um, he was asking, Paul, uh, should we continue to rely on NetHers ratings as a thermal performance benchmark when it doesn't address thermal bridging or air tightness? What's, what's your view? Yeah. Um, very good question. The, the, um, I think the new um, uh, version of, um, of um, the, the NCC will include things about uh, increasing air tightness, and, um, and that, that's a good thing. Um, thermal bridging, I think, also will begin to do that. But it, it's, it's true, the, you know, um, building these, drawing these things into design, into our design and our documentation is one aspect of the thing, and they are important aspects. Uh, that, um, and also the, the, it's also interesting that the software, from how I understand it, it addresses um, it, a lot of the software, parts of Accurate, don't address thermal bridging as well as they could. Um, it's a bit much simpler with air exchange and, uh, and, and air tightness, and um, and so there's a bit there's an advance in the new um, NCC and which the Natters and Accurator and the modelling software is able to embrace to do with slab insulation. Um, so that's a good thing, um, but I think we should continue with Natters and we should also continue with passive house standards, uh, passive house as well, which is also excellent. The thing I like about passive host, it may not set a very high benchmark, but it does have a whole lot of testing and proving that what was designed into the build is actually uh, comes comes out in the in the, in, in the construction. Um, uh, that's a very good thing. Um, Paul, I've got a question here from Claire Bowles. Um, so. Improving, so it's a bit of a statement and a question. So improving energy efficiency can often mean using materials that have a higher embodied carbon. How can we balance this embodied versus operational carbon? What's your view on that? Uh, I think um, there, let me think. I, 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 they're, they're, that argument I've, I've heard before I don't know that it's totally necessary in the sense that it is possible to get very high and we, uh, you know, energy ratings with buildings that have reasonably, don't have particularly high thermal mass in the buildings or interior thermal mass. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it's important too to where you do have materials with high embodied energy and I, I guess the, um, Claire's asking about things like concrete or brickwork and stuff using it very smartly so that it's interior to the insulated skin so that you do get that bang for, that thermal bang for buck from it is really important. Um, and of course, there is a huge difference between the uh, embodied energy in some recycled um, you know, press red bricks, um, the red clippers, um, that uh, might be, uh, you know, that are recycled and then, um, uh, set in or, or laid in, in in a mortar, which uses one of those uh, cements with uh, so one of the yeah, mortar with that um, cement with a lot of supplementary cement material in it. Uh, 
there's a lot less in, embodied energy in a, in a thermally massive wall like that or a rammed earth wall that has um, uh, uses product or, or, or binders other than Portland cement to, to um, or, or avoids binders altogether and gets really smart with the, with the soil um, selection um, that uh, you, you know, there are other ways to do that. And also the other thing with thermal, um, with uh, heat storing capacity, you know, you can see a lot of architects putting um, large volumes of concrete or, um, or masonry into buildings, very, very thick walls, not really understanding that it's not the volume of the thermal mass that gives you, uh, helps you with the amelioration of um, fluctuations from day to night or you could draw in that, that passive soil again or to, to cool the building um, overnight in, in summer when you ventilate it to the outside. It's more the, the actual surface area. You really want a lot of surface area per unit volume of that thermal mass that you're putting into the, in, in, that you're introducing into the building because that's the bit that's active with the interior air. Um, and so there are a few tricks to that. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Paul, that was a very good comment, um, but I think that's sort of, that also highlights on a side note the importance of you know, working with the ESG consultants um, mm -hmm. and optimizing the performance of, sort of, you know, of your designs. You can easily have too much thermal mass in the building and it, and it actually, you know, obviously um, will have a negative effect on the performance. Um, next question. First, uh, thanks, Danny Carney, for withdrawing your second question. That obviously allowed somebody else to have their question answered. Um, Michael McManus asked, um, any recommendations for SCM suppliers or mixed concrete suppliers in Melbourne that could service smaller projects? Yeah. You know, um, it, in the last two to three years, that's, it's come to the point now where virtually, I, I, I'm struggling to think of one concrete, uh, or one you know, of the main concrete suppliers who won't um, produce an, uh, an in what they often call an environmental mix, or they've all got different names for them, but with a minimum of say 30% SCM in. And that might be say for a ground slab, you might put, you know, many, most of the houses at Long Creek were around the 40% mark. If you're doing things like strip footings or blinding concrete or retaining walls or other kind of those mass concrete elements, um, you can go right up way beyond even the 40% mark. Uh, and these, you'll find that most of the, uh, the concrete batching companies are, are happy to do that. Um, and I can also, I mean, I say that we have, there's a fellow who we, he's like a sage to us. He was at Mile Creek. His name's Joe Pietro Santo at Vicnix, a very good person who gave, always gave us very, very sound technical advice. He's a concrete engineer on optimizing mixes and, and getting the right outcomes uh, with uh, environmental concrete. But you know, Pronto, um, you, you name Wholesome, um, Hanson, um, oh gosh, just all, all, really all of them, because we saw all of those companies engaging with Mullum Creek. Um, so how would you, Paul, how would you monitor that? I mean, how can you, how can you check it actually? Would you get a, um, would you check their, you know, their, their bills, their invoice, or get, you get a certificate? Or, or yeah, how? exactly. That, that's exactly right. So we, at, at Mullum Creek, we, Often, you know, I might have even, or Rafi would have been on site when concrete trucks turned up. We actually went, went up to the truck driver and said, could we see the docket? Um, but we always asked the builder to hold the dockets and either give them to us when we're next on site. You have to be quick with them because there's sort of that funny sort of faxy paper that fades really quickly. Or otherwise, if they could scan them and send them to us. Um, but the, 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 the dockets show very clearly Sometimes you might have to ring up the, the, the supplier and say, what does this particular, these codes mean? But we, because once we saw them again and again from one, you know, from the, from the same concrete companies, we got, to, we got familiar with it. Um, it's all this checking on site is as important as specification, whether it relates to concrete or whether it relates, relates to, you know, using bag cement on a job and certainly also with timber products. Um, and we had particular ways to try to minimise um, things going wrong in terms of what turned up on site. Um, and they were, we did things like 
We try to be really anticipatory with the uh, with, with the jobs at hand. So we uh, we would ring up um, the, the builders and say, look, you're we think you're a couple of weeks away from ordering your concrete or or ordering your 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 what will be healthy um, bulk insulation for your roof. Um, all the all the guides to this you'll find on the website. Um, and um, you we um, we would do that early on to try to catch a problem before it occurred. And then we'd also um, try to be on site regularly. If we found a pack of timber, for example, that was Baltic pine and it happened regularly instead of um, rayata, the builder might've been doing the right thing, but the, the supplier wasn't. And it got better and better as the suppliers in the area got to know we were serious, but we would ask for that to be sent back. And because the, the builders invariably asked for the right thing and was supplied the wrong thing, um, we were able to do that and then the suppliers learnt from that and it did happen less and less as the job as the as this uh, building on the estate progressed um, and if there was some timber for example oh, it never happened with concrete but if it happened that with timber uh, some timber was actually put into the build uh, and it was not in accordance with the Mole Creek requirement um, uh, which is quite strict for example if there was um, LVL that came from, again, a Siberian larch from Russia, for example, we would ask for, and I've done this before on jobs previously, previous to Mullen Creek, and it works. We actually, and you can write this into your, into your contract, the building contract, we would ask that they um, make a donation to a, a charitable cause that, that addresses issues with unsustainable timber, uh, cultures in around the world and tries to make things better to to, to um, make a donation to one of them and there are many we, we'd suggested a dozen or so and then people would actually do that they would the builders would do that they would rather do that than have to pull the timber out which is then wasting a whole lot of resource that we didn't want anyway but also wasting a lot of time for them on the build and costing them a lot of extra labor i think that's i think that's very much sorry anthony um I think this is where we as architects sort of can certainly improve and, and obviously you know, write that into our specifications um, and then just make sure we do the right inspections at the right time. Because it's not, it's not standard practice, it's not necessarily at the forefront of everyone's mind um, and it's not standard practice yet. But once you put your mind to it, it's actually relatively easy to, you know, to implement. Yeah, phone calls and you know, like the um, camera that you've got on an iPhone these days, it, it's, um, Makes all that stuff really quite easy, and if you've got it, you know, you've got most we hope we always have cooperative builders or you know, happy builders, and it, it works a treat as well. You don't have to be there all the time, but, but being having in the same way we want the builders to have their head of, ahead of their hammers, we we need to do the same, be anticipatory towards their processes. Um, we might have one more question, and then we'll I'll, I'll hand over to Stefan um, to talk about future events and. I can tell this is a very popular webinar because very few people have dropped off, Paul, so everyone's really listening and eager to see whether this session has been recorded and whether they can uh, listen to it again. So the answer is it has been recorded um, and it will be available. Um, we'll just work through how we do that. So, but yes, the intention is that it is available to everyone to share and so forth. Um, but the question comes from Bridget Skilbeck. Uh, I was wondering what Paul's view is of CLT and engineered timber I'm in his point of view of the binders <coughs> and the lack of recyclability. Do you have a view on that, Paul? Um, my view on what was that first thing just before recyclability? Uh, binders, the use oh, of binders. binders. Yeah, uh, gotcha. yeah. Oh, look, it's really, um, really interesting. Uh, this CLT, uh, most of the CLT that's been put into Australian buildings to date uh, has come from these Baltic pine and spruce forests of Europe um, and other, and, 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 and particularly Eastern Europe, uh, where, uh, where it's really quite sad to see what's going on there and what a really quite you know, biologically diverse and uh, deciduous and evergreen um, forests. Um, the, so most of it has come from there, it's been imported directly from overseas, so that'd be the Forte building and a number of other um, landmark buildings in Australia. 
However, there is um, uh, Exlam that is set up really well now in Albury, in just over the border in New South Wales. And I believe there's another uh, company about to start in Tasmania, and they'll both be working with locally sourced, quite locally sourced radiator pine, uh, plantation pine, to, to make these CO2 products. And I think that's a terrific thing. Um, the, it, it, the, the question, question makes a really good, you know, is it makes a good one a point about the binders as well. And it's a hard one. All engineered timbers, uh, well not all of them, but uh, all that I can think of just at the moment, do have glues and binders in them. They, they have improved in terms of their urea formaldehyde emissions based on kind of industry uh, advancements and, and other kind of um, wants of government and, uh, for public projects and stuff. So that they uh, have a sort of a rating of uh, EO or sometimes better, or often even better than that, with the resins that go into it, the formaldehydes and the VOCs can be low. But yes, they, they, it would be nice to just have a, a simple bit of wood. But the thing is that these engineered timbers actually provide, you can create a whole lot more strength, or you can, you can get that timber to do a whole lot more work, um, whether it's as a cladding or as a, as a primary structural member, um, and which includes CLT, because it's both sort of structural and, and, a, and a, wood, a, kind of a, a building form, um, it is much improved by engineering, which is what, what it's done. And actually, and it's, if I could just sort of divert with that, I felt I didn't answer the first question very well, but maybe I can as a sort of said said way to this is, um, when I mentioned that there's this excess radiator pine, for example, um, from uh, around the world at the moment because of the issues with China and, and COVID and all that. Meanwhile, we've got the we've got Australian Sustainable Hardwoods. That's what the, that's the name of the company that uh, it's in Hayfield, Victoria. That basically processes eighty five percent of the native forest reserve in Victoria. Um, that that operation is I think it employs about one hundred and fifty people, uh, which is not a lot, but it. There's nothing wrong with Australian Sustainable Hardwoods. Their, 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 their operations there, they make the very best of all their timbers. They have a lot of really interesting industrial processes to get the very best out of wood, whether it's for an architectural or for a structural um, purpose. Uh, the problem with them is, is that they draw their wood or they source their wood from this native forest and and also actually using sourcing also European and, and American oak now they're importing timbers because of the, the dearth of Australian timber. There's so much opportunity for companies like that to produce um, local you know, um, engineered timber products uh, and, and provide, they, they're geared up to do it, but there's this resistance. Um, and I think architects putting pressure on those people to say, look, we, we love what you do, but you just don't get your wood from the right place. Us telling them that again and again and again, they, I think they can rise to the occasion, I'm sure they will. Did I answer that one okay? You did, absolutely. Um, so uh, Stefan tells me we're going to have some more questions because he you know, wants to get more answers. So, well, <laughs> yeah, so uh, sorry for keeping you occupied. So uh, yeah. when we're allowed to socialize again, I showed you a bottle of wine. So um, if that's okay. Um, and a uh, short question from Mark Davis. Uh, what about biodiversity in plantation pine? That's a very good point. The, we, um, what the, the position we, we, we took on that at Mullum Creek and are also with Sirius Fairwood is that um, we, uh, we look to allow or approve at Mullum Creek or accept at um, Fairwood for, um, for sale only any timber, whether it's plantation pine or whatever, uh, timber that is, 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 has been purposefully planted on previously cleared farmland. If it's that's if it's not from recycled stock, so and that's very important because there is not much biodiversity in a in a in a degraded paddock, open paddock, the farmland that's not working very well for other agricultural purpose, and there's actually not all that much biodiversity in a 
a blue gum monocultural plantation as well, or even an agroforestry plantation where you have a number of mixed species and you graze cattle or sheep under you know, the trees while the grass is still growing in the first 10, 15 years, and then uh, the timber itself has enough value. So we're really wanting to avoid, at the, avoid wherever we, or we absolutely avoid um, sourcing timber from um, places where there is that, uh, the biodiversity, but with, with right out of pine, as he's absolutely right, there's a it's a monocultural plantation with, with relatively little um, biodiversity under it. But by yes, and, and but if you were to, for example, clear some a native forest to plant right out of pine, uh, we would support that. Um, and not that doesn't happen so much, or hasn't been in the last ten to twenty years. Um, but if it were, we would not support that. Um, I think we'll wrap up the questions at this point. Um, I just think it was a really brilliant um, talk. I'm going to hand over to Stefan in, in a moment. I just wanted to acknowledge um, everyone's messages at the start when uh, each lot of individuals who attendees acknowledged uh, where they're from, their own um, country. So I think that was really, really lovely. So it was a really nice touch. So I'm going to hand over to Steph, who's going to talk a little bit about um, architects declare and you know heartfelt thanks um, Paul on that really fantastic talk. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, do you want to do sorry, do you want to put up the bring up the, the screen? Oh, uh, Paul, would you mind stop sharing and we will share? Um, yeah. I've only got one. Maybe just the one with the working groups. Um, share screen. Um, then. Oh, and I'll mute. I'll mute. Oh, no. That one? If that's one, I'm used to Only up this one. This one, yeah, that's fine. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> just bear with us, would you? Um, okay, just a brief wrap up. So, uh, and I won't be too long because um, obviously it was Paul's presentation and it was really great. And um, apologies that we couldn't answer all the questions. Um, but what, what I think would be good to do, um, Talina Edwards has set up the, um, the Facebook discussion group um, and I think it's worth discussing sort of obviously sort of you know, um, engaging in there. Um, generally, um, yeah, obviously, maybe Anthony, can you scroll down to the sure. bottom, the very end of it, um, very end of it, yeah. So they are all the basically uh, the, the social media form or the sort of, you know, social media um, that we can sort of engage in. Um, and the Facebook group's really, um, you know, yeah, really fantastic. Um, I won't say too much, I won't talk too much in detail about um, upcoming events. Um, we're going to send out a newsletter, um, or the next newsletter, we're going to ask for um, volunteers, um, maybe sort of, you know, respond to us. How are we, how are we going to do that, Anthony? TV? How should we? <laughs> Um, so the intention is that we, uh, in two weeks' time, meet a whole series of volunteers who would like to be part of the movement. Um, so if you're interested in, in joining up, at the moment, primarily there's Claire, Talina, Stefan and me, who are, uh, and, and a few others who are working in the Victorian group, shall we say, and we, we know that there are people who are keen to be involved. And uh, we're going to follow the lead from New South Wales who have already set up some frameworks for working groups. So if there are people out there who are interested, you're welcome to email us on info at architectsdeclare.com.au. Uh, a newsletter will go out from Talina um, also, but basically the intention is that we will meet in a virtual space like this with all of the um, potential volunteers and brainstorm you know, which group uh, each participant would like to be part of. And, and then we'll sort of um, work it from there. So, you know, by all means, put your hand up if you're interested, even if you're, you know, thinking about it. And then we'll we'll meet uh, essentially this time in two weeks' time to with 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 whoever puts up their hand to see where we can, you know, form smaller working groups around different um, areas of interest. We'll continue on with the webinars, I think, yeah. because I think that's proven to be a real success. I mean, the, the number of people that have uh, put their hand up. I mean, partly because of the quality of the speaker, Paul, but also I think because there's just such a lot of interest in this topic. We know that COVID-19 has, you know, changed things for a lot of people, but, you know, the climate emergency is still really relevant. So um, a few closing words, 
Stefan? Uh, me? No, actually, no, only one thing. Um, yes, make sure you've signed up to our e-news. Um, yeah, so, and um, then you can actually also um, access the presentation. Is that correct? Is it? Um, in due, yeah. to, in due course. In due course. Uh, uh, I hope within a week, you know, certainly we've recorded it. So we've just got to work out formats and things like that. So certainly the intention is that it's uh, accessible. Mm. Um, and yeah. All right, okay. Well, I'm not a person of final words, so <laughs> we might have to wait for the next webinar. Um, yeah, so look, thanks again. For, uh, thanks, thanks again, everybody. It was fantastic. It was great. Um, we'll, keep, we'll keep moving and we'll keep, you know, caring for the planet and, and work together. Yeah, so, and just yeah. lastly, really heartfelt thanks to Paul for that really fantastic uh, presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, stay healthy, everyone. All right, okay. That's a wrap. Lots of positive comments at the end, which is great. And, uh, good.